بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد All praises is for Allah who is pleased with Islam as a religion for us and who completed the favor upon us and who perfected the religion for us. I testify that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah alone. He has no associate, the King, the Truth, the Manifest. I testify that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger whom Allah sent us or whom Allah sent as a mercy for mankind. So he fulfilled the trust, sincerely advised the Ummah, the nation, and conveyed the message clearly. O oh Allah, send peace, salutations, and blessings upon him, upon his family, his companions, and all those who traverse his path and are guided by his guidance up until the day of judgment. Alhamdulillah, today is our first session where we discuss the hadith of Jibril and the teachings of Islam. The importance in this hadith is that when we look at the discussion of scholars around this hadith, one of the scholars mentioned that indeed I had a desire for a long time to write a separate explanation for the hadith of Jibril, which comprises the explanation of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. And all of these terms, we are obviously going to discuss it in further detail. Indeed, the Prophet wasallam said at the end of his hadith, so when we hear the hadith, which is the prophetic report or the narration of the Prophet or the sayings of our Prophet Muhammad, at the ending of this hadith, what captured the interest of the scholars was that the Prophet wasallam said to the companions who were in front of him, he said, this was Jibreel. And we know that Jibreel was the important angel who brought all of the messages to the prophets. So the Prophet said, this was Jibreel. He came to you in order to teach you your religion. That objective has been actualized by the blessing of Allah. Uh, and, and that is the important aspect where the Prophet said he came to you. And, and although we'll see in the hadith that Jibreel was the one asking the questions and the Prophet wasallam was the one who was answering all of these questions. So I took down one or two very prominent scholars who made mention of this hadith. One is Al-Qadi Iyad. And Al-Qadi Iyad was from a place in Morocco. He was from the north of Africa. And he mentioned he was a very prominent judge in his time. Um, in fact, he wrote one book which gave, or which spoke about the cure of the Prophet ﷺ, which he gave to certain remedies, the miracles of the Prophet, and this book of his became very famous. And so he mentions that this hadith comprises an explanation of all the acts of worship. So he says this hadith comprises an explanation of all the acts of worship, the outward ones and the inward ones, from the tenets of Iman, the actions of the limbs and the sincerity of the souls and its cautions against the harmful actions, to the extent that all of the Sharia sciences refer back to it and branch out from it, from this hadith. He said, and our book, which we have titled Excellent Objectives Concerning What is Binding Upon Men, is, ba is based upon this hadith and its three categories. Like I made mention, the three categories, what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan. One more scholar will make mention, Imam Nawawi, who we know was a famous scholar of his time, said, and know that this hadith combines all the types of sciences, fields of knowledge, excellent manners, and civil behaviors. Rather, it is the basis of Islam, as we have mentioned from Al-Qadi Iyad. So we can see that the scholars, and there are many other scholars, Al-Qurtubi, many other great scholars who spoke highly of this hadith. 
So, in order for us to understand where this hadith, the reason for this here, we first have to understand how this hadith came about. So we'll start off with giving an introduction into where this hadith came and what were the reasons for the narration of this hadith. It is related by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. Right. So, firstly, Imam Muslim, we all know the six, there's six books of hadith, which is everybody who studies, who wants to study prophetic narrations or the sayings of the Prophet. There are six books which, there are other books, but six books you'll constantly hear scholars quoting from. So the first is Imam Bukhari, a scholar by the name of Imam Bukhari. Then you have Imam Muslim. So these scholars in their books, they mention sayings of the Prophet uh, and, and, and authentic narrations. So we have Imam Bukhari, we have Imam Muslim, and then we have um, Ibn Majah, we have Imam Malik, we have Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, and we have Imam Nasai, these are all the names. So the name that I'm mentioning here is Imam Muslim. All right, so, so Imam Muslim will write that down as one of the great scholars of Hadith, of the Prophet. When I say Hadith, because we have some new Muslims, when I say Hadith, Hadith means the sayings, whatever has been narrated by the Prophet Muhammad. So that is the meaning of Hadith. There is an, when we have our Hadith class, we will go more into detail of what does Hadith mean and the different types of Hadith and the different categories. This, this, is, this is now for us to explain what is Islam. And so Imam Muslim in his Sahih, when we say Sahih, this you can also write down, Sahih means that the Hadith is authentic. And how do we know that the saying is authentic? So we need to know that there is two parts to a Hadith. One is the people who narrate it from the Prophet. So how does a Hadith work? We, just, to, just to give you a short understanding, you have myself, for example, Zakaria. All right? I make mention that I heard, and I'm just giving an example. I say that I heard so and so saying that do not go out of the road, for example, do not go out of the road. So I say I heard, or I was present when so and so said, do not go to the road. So now the hadith begins because I'm using the first person who I heard it from, and then after me, whoever I tell becomes a chain of that narration. Do we get it? So if I tell it to the next person, Ismail or Abdurrahman, so they get into the chain of that narration. And so here it is related by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. So what it means is that, first of all, we have to make sure when we, when we mention hadith, one of the important aspects is that the scholars look at the people that are narrating that hadith, are they authentic? And the words of the hadith. So inshallah, when we come to hadith, we'll explain. So Imam Muslim in his sahih, with his isnad, with his chain of narrators who narrated that hadith from Yahya bin Ya'mar, who said, the first one to speak about the divine or pre-decree in Al-Basra was Ma'bad bin Al-Juhani. So what happened was that there were a few people who were discussing about predestination. Does, does God know whatever, does Allah know whatever we are going to do? Is he aware of whatever we are going to do? So they were discussing this. The people were, were arguing about this. They were discussing it. So Humayd ibn Abdurrahman al-Himyari and I departed for Hajj or Umrah. We said if we meet someone from the companions of the messenger of Allah, then we will ask him about what these people say concerning Al-Qadr of predestination. 
the divine decree because they just heard people discussing it and there were a few contentious issues that they didn't understand. So they said, you know what, when we go for Umrah, or for Hajj, when we meet the companions, the, 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 those that were close to the Prophet Muhammad, we will ask them to explain to us about the, the, what these people were discussing about. So Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar, Al-Khattab entered the mosque unexpectedly. My companion and I surrounded him, one of us at his right and the other at his left. I assumed that my companion would entrust me to speak. I said, Aba Abdul Rahman, indeed they have emerged in our midst a people who recite the Quran and seek knowledge, and he mentioned their affair. And they claim that there is no qadr and that the affair is one of absolute free will. These people are saying that free will, you know, God doesn't intervene in our decisions. He doesn't know what we are going to do. So this is what they were discussing. He replied, when you meet these, those people, then inform them that I am free from them and that they are free from me. By the one whom Abdullah ibn Umar swears by, if one of them were to spend like the mountains of Uhud, Allah would not accept it from him until he believes in the Qadr. Then he said, my father Umar ibn al-Khattab informed me saying, now we're starting with the hadith of Jibreel. So, do we understand how this hadith of Jibreel came about? They were discussing about Qadr, and these sahab, these companions, they heard the discussion and they said, we don't want to get involved. They went for Hajj, and when they came there, they met the son of Umar, who we know was the second khalif, the second uh, um, leader of, of, of Islam after Abu Bakr. They met his son, and they asked him about this, and he began narrating to them this hadith in order to give them an understanding. Now we come to the hadith Jibreel, which we are going to be doing for the next few Saturdays in our lesson. Once when we were with the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day, there came to us a man with intensely white clothes and intensely black hair. No sign of travel could be seen upon him, and no one from amongst us knew him. He came and sat by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He placed his knees up to the Prophet's knees, and he placed his palms upon the thighs of the Prophet. So this person who came with intensely white clothes in the desert, with intensely white clothes and intensely black hair, no sign of travel could be seen upon him, and no one knew him. And obviously the prophet here was in a lesson teaching, and this person comes and he sits in front of the prophet. And when he sits in front of him, he places his knees up to the prophet's knees. And he places his palms upon the thighs of the prophet. And he said, O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. So the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Islam is that you testify that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that you establish the prayer and that you pay the zakat which is the alms and that you fast the month of Ramadan and perform pilgrimage, which is the Hajj, to the house if you have the means. If you have the means, then you perform the pilgrimage. He said, you have spoken truthfully. So this person who's sitting in front of the Prophet said, Sadaqta, you have spoken truthfully. He said, so this is Sayyidina Umar says, so we were amazed that he would ask him and then attest to his truthfulness. He said, inform me about Iman. He said, it is that you believe in Allah. So this is Iman, which is called faith. So one is, he first asked him about Islam. He explained to him, what is Islam? Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, 
وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. That is the testifying. That is Islam. And then you have your prayer, your your arms, your fasting, your Hajj. So that is all included in your prayer. Then he is now explaining to him what is faith. He said, inform me about Iman. He said, it is that you believe in Allah, his angels, that you believe in all the angels, his books, right? And when we speak of his books, we're speaking of like the Injil, right? We're speaking of the palms of David, the Torah, uh, uh, the Zabur, the Torah, the, the commandments that were sent to Moses, the, 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 the Bible that was sent to Isa. We're speaking of all of these, the books that you believe. So he said that you believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers. And when we're speaking of messengers, we're speaking of Jesus. We're speaking of, so Jesus, Sayyidina, who we say, Sayyidina Isa. We're speaking of Dawood, who we say, David. We're speaking of Yahya, who we say, who, 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 who is called John the Baptist. We're speaking of Noah. We're speaking of Abraham. We're speaking of Muhammad. All of these were messengers. And to be a Muslim, you have to believe in all of these messengers. The last day, we believe that the world will come to an end. There will be a last day. And the Qadr. And predestination. Quickly, who can tell me what connection does this hadith have with the first hadith that I mentioned? Who can tell me quickly? After I mentioned the word Qadr. What connection does this? Why did, say now, why did Abdullah ibn Umar mention to them this hadith? Right? The reason he mentioned to them this hadith of Qadr was that he was showing them that this word Qadr, which they were arguing about and that they did not believe in, that this is also part of our faith, our, our, our belief that we have to believe that God knows everything. Everything in his, is, is in his knowledge. The good of it and the evil of it. So predestination, the good of it and the evil of it. And we'll explain this. He said, you have spoken truthfully. He said, so inform me about Ihsan. We'll come and explain what is the meaning of Ihsan. He said, it is that you worship Allah as if you are seeing him. So Ihsan... So now we know what is Islam, we know what is the, 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 the pillars of Iman, now we come on to Ihsan. What is Ihsan? Here in the hadith it mentions, he said, it is that you worship Allah as if you are seeing him. So to worship God as if you are able to see him. That is the level that a person needs to bring himself in worship. Or since you do not see him, then know that he sees you. So there's two types of levels which a believer can try to attain in life. One is to worship God as if you see him. And if the level below that is to worship God to such an extent that you know that he is watching you. And to have that in your mind whenever you do anything, whatever you do, to know that he is watching you. Once you reach that level, it will be impossible for you to commit a sin willingly or to, to, to get yourself into trouble because you are always cognizant, isn't it? You are always aware. How are we acting now in, 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 in Corona? <laughs> with, with, even, 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 when we, even when we pull out money from the ATM, we are applying sanitize, we're sanitizing. Even when we before we do anything, we're always aware that there's a virus out there, there's a pandemic out there, isn't it? We're always aware of it. And it, when the pandemic was taking so many lives, everybody was alert. Now, at least maybe it has dropped a bit, but in the initial stages, 
Everybody was alert. Sometimes we wouldn't even visit our own families. Everyone was alert. So this is the type of alertness that they are speaking of. He said, it is that you worship Allah as if you are seeing him. So since you do not see him, then he sees you. He said, inform me about the hour, the final day. He said, the one being asked about it knows no more than the questioner. Nobody knows when is the last day. The Prophet ﷺ, Allah did not give him that knowledge of when is the final day, nor did Jibreel know when is the final day. This is in the knowledge of Allah. When will be the final day? He then said, the one being asked about it knows no more than the questioner. He said, inform me about its signs. What are the signs leading to the final days? And this is something which we will really discuss towards the ending of our lessons when we come on to Ihsan. He said, when the slave woman gives birth to her mistress, and when you see the barefooted, naked, and destitute shepherds of sheep competing in the construction of tall buildings. He said, then he left, and we remained for a time. Then he said to me, O oh Umar, now the Prophet says, O oh Umar, do you know who the questioner was? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, he was Jibreel, he came to teach you your religion. The hadith ends there. Now I'm just going to go over the first hadith that I mentioned before I mentioned the hadith Jibreel, and then we'll conclude. I want us to take this very slowly. These are hadith. Or the meaning of this hadith, and inshallah, next week we'll discuss on what is Islam, the, the, the part. But before we go to that, benefits from the story before the hadith. When we were listening to that hadith, which I told you, those companions, they heard people speaking about, in today's time we get people who, who believe in free will. So this is not, this is a discussion which already in that time was happening. We have agnostics today, we have atheism, we have people who believe that there is no God. So these issues were from those times also, right? So what happened was that these two companions, right, or we, or we will call them, so we must remember that you have those that saw the Prophet Muhammad, we call them Sahaba. They are called companions. Those that saw the companions but did not see the Prophet, what do we call them? Tabi'een, right? We, they, they are called the Tabi'oon, meaning that those that only saw the companions but they didn't see the Prophet. So these two, they were called Tabi'oon because they didn't see the Prophet, but they saw companions who saw the Prophet. So when they heard people discussing and the person who was discussing, who became famous and opened up his own sect called al qadariyah was a person by the name of Ma'bad al-Juhani or Ma'bad al-Juhaini. He was discussing these issues of free will. And what did he mean by free will? Free will meant that, you know what, God doesn't know what you want to do. If you want to kill somebody or if you want to go to the mosque or if you want to do something good, God doesn't know it until you do it. And we, what we have to believe is that God knows everything from the time that you were created until the time you leave this world. He has knowledge of whatever, you, whatever actions you want to do, God has knowledge of that. So these wanted to create their own type of understanding. So when these two uh, Tabi'un companions heard this, and this is something for us to learn, when we hear people speaking contentious issues or issues that we don't understand, don't just go to the internet or go to, um, you know, go and Google it and say, let me check on Google or let me check a video on YouTube. Make sure that your knowledge comes from reliable sources. This is a very important aspect in life. Make sure that your knowledge comes from reliable sources. And if you keep this in standard, then even people who advise you, make sure you are advised by people who have wisdom. By, and if you're asking about something, 
Make sure that the people who you're asking are in that art. Can you ask, uh, for example, you want to travel and, and then you go and ask a mechanic or someone that, that, that deals with, 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 with cars, you're asking him about construction, building. He'll give you his opinion, but can we, can we say that, that the opinion will be strong? Unlike if you go to somebody who has constructed hundreds of buildings. There's a difference. If you want to do farming and, and, and you're asking somebody who, who's in sports, who plays soccer or something, so go and ask the people of that art who are in that science, who specialize in that, go and ask them. Similarly, what did these two do when they heard these contentious issues? They went and asked the people who were in that, um, you know, the, uh, in that field. And who did, who did they choose? The companions of the prophet. So when we have matters of religion, make sure that you go to reliable scholars who can answer you. That is one that we learn. Secondly, one of the other is that in the story, there are various types of manners. The way these scholars approached um, Abdullah ibn Umar, they approached him in a very respectful way. So this also teaches us from that story that we heard, how do you approach people of knowledge or somebody who is going to give you advice, you approach him in a way with manners, the way they sat down around him, the way they spoke to him. This is also important for us to know that it is important for us when we ask these questions or when we discuss, we, we go to them in a way which has manners. The fourthly is just seeking a religious verdict and taking knowledge from the scholar occurs in the state of so here, Abdullah ibn Umar, they mentioned that he was walking. So you can take knowledge from somebody who is walking, someone who is sitting down, somebody who is who's, who's riding on, 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 a, on, on a conveyance. Who's, you can take knowledge from anywhere. That is what we learn from this narration. Another aspect that we learn is that belief, iman, that Allah already knew with his knowledge whatever the servants will do from goodness and evil, and obedience and disobedience before he created and brought them into existence. He knows who from amongst them is from the people of paradise and who is from the people of the fire. He prepared for them reward and punishment as compensation for their deeds before he created and formed them. All of that is written and calculated with him and the deeds of the servants occur in accordance with what has proceeded in his knowledge and his book. That is what we learn from that hadith. So inshallah, respected listeners, next week we will begin with what is Islam. We had to introduce you to the hadith of Jibreel in order for us to understand. We've mentioned, so just to have a conclusion, we firstly mentioned the reasons that led to this hadith of Jibreel. The reason was that there were companions who went and met with Abdullah ibn Umar. They asked him about Qadr, which is predestination. And in order for him to prove that our Iman consists of believing in predestination and the divine decree, he mentioned to them this whole hadith of Jibreel. When we mention the hadith of Jibreel, within the hadith of Jibreel, he explained to them what is Islam. And look how detailed he explained to them, and this is when you go to somebody who specializes in knowledge. He, he didn't just tell them that, no, you have to believe in divine decree. He first went and explained what is Islam. Then he explained what is Iman. And then he explained what is Ihsan. Right? So this is the benefit of going to somebody. And look, narrating to them this hadith, it becomes a hadith which up until today we are still using to teach people what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan. So inshallah in the next lesson we will continue with the hadith, the first part of the hadith, what is Islam. Today we did do what is Islam, we explained what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan. Next week we will go into detail 
explaining what is Islam. It might take one or two more Saturdays to explain what is Islam so that the importance of these lessons is for us to be able when we meet people. When somebody asks you why you are Muslim, what is Islam? We are able to explain to them. We are able to tell them what is Islam. And many people, um, so many people are coming into Islam. This is also important for us to show them that this is Islam. This is what has made us believe and what has made us love the religion of Islam. These are the reasons. So inshallah next week we will continue with the topic of what is Islam. And inshallah we will see how long it takes us to go to the next topic. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Anybody has any questions? Yes. That I was the one who made tables that I made with wood because because trees are wood. Allah has created the trees, and from the trees, Allah has given man the power to use the trees and make wood, and make matches, and make all of. Uh, you know, that's why we call them carpenters. So Allah is the one who has taught men how to use the trees and how to turn it into nice wood. You understand? So Allah has created steel and metal and he has given men the understanding how to make an aeroplane, how to make a car. So in actual fact, Allah is still the one who is the creator of all of these things because he is the one who gave the knowledge of how to create it. You understand? Yes. Hmm. Is it true that beans are made from smokeless fire? From fire. They are created from fire. Why you want to meet one? <laughs> Anybody else? Appa? Anything? You shouldn't feel shy. Ask whatever you'll need to ask. If you can write it down also and leave it, if you feel, you can write it down in your note and just leave it behind and inshallah we'll answer it in the next classes. Anything? I've got a bit of a long-winded one, Mona. So, we know that Allah has created gravity, for example. So whether I'm here in Pakalane or I go to the States and I, I do that, because of gravity it falls. So there seems to be a sort of schism within scholarship. Some people say, or they insist that, no, it's because Allah willed it to fall, it fell. Mm. Whereas other people will say, Allah has created this thing which we call gravity, mm. which operates throughout space and time, I guess. And that is how Allah made the thing to fall. So it, essentially you're saying the same thing and it might become a mundane debate. But how deep do we go into that and where do we go the line? Look, when you take these issues, say for example, like, uh, you want to do this thing there? Okay, so you're saying that basically some are saying that gravity, because I want to understand, uh, you're saying some are saying that for gravity, which is, okay, so for example, in space there's no gravity, mm -hmm. all right? So when the steam falls, Allah is the one that whirled it to fall down, yeah. right? So you look at, for example, in the Quran, there's verses where, for example, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even a, a leaf that falls from the tree, Allah has, Allah knows the amount of flips it takes before it touches the ground, right? So the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would be that the action of it falling, right, and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah knows um, how many flips it takes before it touches the ground. So I don't understand what, what would be the... So basically, whenever something falls to the ground, do we say that every time something falls... So every is, time, is, is that, that Allah has given it? That that's the action of Allah, or do we say... Allah has created this force called gravity, which is always an operation within this world. 
same like same like uh, somebody who is going to commit evil or going to kill somebody all right allah has given the action of movement all right and you the one who chooses what you are going to do with that movement or what you are going to do with that action same like somebody coming to the mosque he decides i want to come to the mosque or i want to turn so allah gives that energy all right and with that energy you decide what you are going to do with it so that we don't say that um evil so so yes in in predestination and this is the, this is this is the reason why you ask me because um even with we we, we say that um uh, how would i say it? it is in the knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the energy is given by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is just how it i think so that would be the better explanation that allah has created this energy right and until allah, so if allah doesn't desire it to fall then but until then allah has allowed it allah has given that energy for it to every time you throw it up it falls down i think so that would be much more or what do you think i think so well we can spend another session on it if you want it but I just want to take your brain on yeah this. because what what do some what do some say uh, basically that sort of dismissing gravity that every time something falls then basically ascribing every single one of those actions not ultimately but individually to Allah so this falls now Allah did it tomorrow the leaf will fall Allah did it instead of sort of saying Allah created the energy called gravity whatever it yeah is. that's what I'm and saying you know it, it, it either way either way nothing is impossible for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but to given a better understanding i would say that allah has created the energy for that otherwise every time your lump moving allah has created your lump to move every time you look every time you turn your head allah has created you get what i'm saying whereas we can just say that allah has created the energy for these movements and we fall into that We have to. Those are the scientific ones, huh? <laughs> yeah, philosophical. Anybody else? Ah yes. What are the things of public relations? Um, I'll, I'll I'll write it down for you. I'll write it on the page. All right. We got a page for all the lessons and information, and that I'll just add you on the page, so that you can keep in contact with. We normally have most of the students come but many of them are sick or not well so yeah yeah okay subhanallah bihamdi subhanakallah